So the next one on the list is Alexandra Smith. And uh, she's a great uh, storyteller. Well, you heard her yesterday. So that she does not need any better introduction of what she did yesterday. So she's going to help us create more work opportunities by being present. So quite a challenging title because I am present. So yes, yeah, it's a cliffhanger. I, well, I literally hang on. So, okay, give Alexandra a big hand. Hello, everybody. Welcome this afternoon. I'd like to start with this picture. You may know it, everybody think knows it, maybe. It's the fountain of Marcel uh, Duchamp. Um, I think it was 1917, yes. And I remember this lecture I had when I was still in, as a theater scientist following classes at my professor. And we had this discussion about what is art. And we were thinking, yeah, what is art? And my professor claimed that once something is positioned in a museum or an exhibition, then it's a work of art, because then it becomes part of the art institution. And then some of us claimed, well, um, maybe it's art if you first follow an academic art study. And then others claimed, well, yeah, maybe it's art when you can really earn money with it and make a profession out of it. And you can go on and on forever, but that is not really what I want to talk to you about today. Um, a little bit about myself. I follow two academic art studies, which is uh, theater, sign, uh, theater science and uh, literary studies. Um, and I really didn't care about being an artist at all. I cared about following my passion and do what I love most, which was writing. So, uh, and of course, I love the theater as well. Welcome. <laughs> Some may claim that maybe I am an artist because I write books and my books are sold at bookshops and um, I also write for uh, papers and, and news magazines and everything, so on and so on. Uh, they may claim I'm an artist because I write theater plays and I performed in theater. You can just name it what you want, but for me it's not really an interesting question because I like to call myself an entrepreneur. Why is that? Because it really gives me a lot of freedom, even more freedom than maybe comes from being an artist. Um, I think, especially in Holland, you have a certain amount of freedom as an artist. You can um, make work of art that are maybe critical, um, no one will stop you. Uh, to a certain uh, extent, you can just do what you want and be free as an artist. And you, uh, you make your own work in your own time. So in that sense, you could say, well, I'm freer than an employee. But at the same time, if you don't earn money with your art, that's not really freedom either, because you have to pay the rent, right? So that's why I prefer to call myself an entrepreneur, because as an entrepreneur, I can just decide whether or not I want to be an artist. I can just decide what I want to be as a human being. And the great thing about it is you just go to the Chamber of Commerce and you enroll yourself as whatever you want to be called. So um, I wanted to be called a writer and um, someone who is acting, an actress, and someone who's giving trainings. And the great thing about it is I enroll in the Chamber of Commerce and everyone calls me that. I put it on my website and everybody calls me that. I don't have to wait for any critique to call me a writer. In fact, I was calling myself that ever since I was little because I was always writing. And if you do something long enough, it becomes you. It's simple as that. I don't need other people. So um, sometimes when you write, you don't really have the opportunity to write what you want to write if, if publishers say, well, we are not going to publish your book. And this happens with my second book. Uh, I had a publisher for my first book, but my second book, I didn't have a publisher yet. Um, and I was just like knocking on doors of publishers and they were saying, yeah, you know, you write very well, but we feel that maybe it's too much of a niche. Because I was doing this project on my second book. I was uh, calling it a challenge. And the form was a diary. And the challenge was, I'm going to write this book in 100 days, and I will write everything I do to try and deal with this 
crisis I had, because I had a crisis with my, with my earnings. And uh, the goal was to double my monthly income in a period of 100 days. And they were saying, yeah, but it's, you know, the forum is a diary, so maybe it's too personal, and your target audience are independent professionals and entrepreneurs, and, well, we feel that maybe there are not too many of them in Holland. So a lot of publishers are a little bit conservative, especially in the literary world, and I was thinking, not enough. There are like 800,000 entrepreneurs in Holland. What are you talking about? So I decided to do it myself because I was already on, on one third of the book and I'm like, if I start something, I want to finish it. So um, I finished it and I decided to publish it myself because we are now living in days that we can publish ourselves, which is great. And it became a success. A lot of newspapers wrote about it because everybody loves to talk about entrepreneurs in crisis. When it was times of crisis, it was uh, yeah, something that was actual happening. So, uh, and a lot of entrepreneurs started emailing me their stories, because that's what happens when you share a story. People like to stare, uh, tell their story as well. So I was thinking, ha, I did it. And then I also got asked to give a TED talk in 2015, and um, that was actually about that book. And that, then from that, uh, then on, my career really took off. So it was a good thing that I just decided to do it and go ahead with it anyway. But it also comes from the spirit of, hey, I'm an entrepreneur, I can decide for myself, I'll do it myself. And you earn more money as well, if you do it yourself. So the second idea I had, um, when you're a theater scientist and you're acting, of course, you want to act as well. Uh, I'm doing acting, I think, over 20 years now, and I've acted in theater plays, um, I've acted in commercials, and um, I was doing a lot of trainings acting, which is in Holland, uh, for instance, for the KLM, when you're an assessment actor, uh, you have to play that you're an employee that is mad at their boss, and you just have to provoke the whole time someone that has to learn how to be a good manager. So I was doing that, but I was, I was kind of missing the theater. Um, so we are like uh, in my seventh year of entrepreneurship, and I was thinking, haven't been in a theater for a long time, I want to write a play again, and I want to act in that play. How am I going to do that? And, and there's no use for me, this is also thinking as an entrepreneur, there's no use to making it if I don't get to perform it. But if you're in your seventh year of entrepreneurship, you have built a network around yourself. Um, so I found two other actors who were like me, semi-actors, semi-entrepreneurs, or uh, a professional working in the psych psychiatry. Ah, welcome. <laughs> and we decided to, uh, to do it and use our network. And what we did is we played at Fringe Festival, we played at the Parade, which is a big festival in Holland. Uh, and we played at Erasmus Park Westwaarts Festival. So we found places to perform and we were really happy because if you're working towards uh, the end of the play, you want to perform it, right? So this was something that I did. And then the other thing happened is I wanted to give trainings because when I uh, beat that crisis in the book, I write how I did that, um, I decided that I needed other products to sell, like services. So I started to give trainings and workshop sessions and coaching sessions. And I didn't wait for opportunities or training companies to knock on my door. I just had to create them myself. So I started my own training company and uh, I just found alliances with other training companies. And the result of that is that I'm now coaching managers uh, for the European Commission, European Parliament, but also big companies in Holland. And I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't dream of doing that like 15 years ago. I would just think, have hey, me doing that? No. And it's pretty much fun as well. If you're an artist and you think about um, your target audience, sometimes you think too limited because those are just people, just like you and me, and they love artists. So they love a different perspective, and um, they just want to learn storytelling as badly as anyone. So that's what I'm doing right now. So the first thing I want you to think about is decide who you are. Because when I was beating that crisis and I needed to think about new services and products, it started with me and thinking, rethinking, who am I really? Who am I really? Um, and I was thinking, okay, let's name three things, you know, because 
I have so many talents and interests, I go very broad, but I have to name three things because otherwise people will not be able to remember me. They'll be like, yeah, Alexandra, she does something with writing and something with singing and something with that and that. I didn't want that, so I was thinking, what is there, what I'm really doing? So I came to, I'm a storyteller. You know, I tell stories. It, it doesn't matter if it's a theater play or a book or a film. I just finished a documentary course. It doesn't matter what medium I choose, I'm a storyteller. So that was the first thing I came up with. Uh, and the second thing was, I am a trainer, because I teach people, I help people with stories. And the third thing was acting, because when I'm not writing stories or helping people with stories, I am part of a story. So I would like to give you two minutes and think for yourself, can you come up with three things that you're confident about, this is who I am? So just take two minutes, I'll wait, and come up with three things. Of course, some of you already know that, or some of you are just really one thing which is perfect. I mean, never stress, ah, can I do this, can I do that? But three things if you have stress and you can't choose. Think of three things. Welcome. <laughs> and the reason I ask you this, because during this lecture I will take you through a few steps, and so you can leave, hopefully inspired, thinking about new products, services, and maybe new audiences where you can sell more of your art. That's the main goal. So it took me a whole week, I think, to think of those three things when I was doing uh, coaching sessions as a career coach. So uh, don't feel bad when it doesn't happen in two minutes. Just take it with you. Um, if there's someone who's struggling with choosing, no, no one is struggling with choosing. Oh, someone is. Okay, two, two people, okay. Welcome to the club. <laughs> three people. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Mm, well, maybe some of them are... <laughs> well, I mean, it warms my heart if most of you know already. This is the second step. Values. Um, we all have values. Uh, we're brought up with values. But most values we have, especially when we grow older, are formed through our personal experiences. And that is why a value is usually emotional to you. Um, to give an example, m one of my favorite is freedom. Uh, because when I grew up, the first 19 years of my life, uh, I grew up in a very strict environment. Um, I wasn't able to do all the things that I loved. So when I moved out, freedom for me was very important. And um, for me, that's a great reason to become an entrepreneur, because then you're free to do whatever you want to do and to create whatever you want to create. So for me, that's a, 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 a personal value that is emotional. And a value is something that you feel is important um, and where you base your behavior on and where you base your choices on. So it could be that you want to treat people in a certain manner. It could be that you feel that your work should be from a certain quality or whatever. And I have 26 values here as an example. Um, I just did something with uh, A to Z, so um, of course there are not all the values, so by all means think of values yourself, but just to inspire you. And I would like to ask you to think of three values that fit what you just chose as the three positions you have, like whether it is an artist or an entrepreneur or a trainer or whatever it is that you like to call yourself. Choose values. And the thing about values in your work, eh, sometimes you uh, visit a company and they have this big sign with values, these are the values of our company, and probably you notice that the bigger the company, um, the less people care about those values because it's such a big company that they create their own atmosphere. But for you as an independent professional, it becomes your work becomes very personal, and that is why that the values you choose for your work should never be in conflict with your personal values. Because if it is, you will not feel comfortable in your work. So just take a minute or so to pick three values that fit the positions you just thought of, or maybe had, didn't have to think. So that fit who you are as a person, as an artist.
as a professional. And again, if you don't come up with it now, just take it with you, something to think about when you're lying in bed, not able to sleep because it's so hot outside. It's very important, the values, and I'll tell you, explain to you later why. For now, I will uh, just continue, because if you know what kind of person you are, if you're an artist or an entrepreneur or a professional or a trainer or whatever, coach, you have to think of products as well. And here, it's, it's kind of crucial to use your creativity, and we're in a room full of creative people, I think. So it's kind of crucial to, to use your creativity to think about products. So the next exercise, I will give you some examples for products that I thought of, <laughs> that I could share with you. Um, it could be, as I mentioned before, workshops. It could be coachings, but it also could be postcards. I mean, we've heard before all the opportunities we now have, the technical opportunities to print our work. Uh, and the great thing about postcards is that it's a small thing, but it's also a subtle way of advertising your work. Because if people like the postcards, they like the what's on it, and there's their website on it, it's inviting them to, you know, to look at your art. And the same goes for thinking of small presents that you can make. Uh, people love to buy presents that are a little bit out of the ordinary, not something that they have to buy in, at HEMA or you know, some kind of shop that everybody goes to. They like presents that are unusual. And if you're creative and you're an artist, maybe you can think of small presents that you can sell online as well. And again, that is a subtle way of advertising your work. Of course, you can also, like me, write a book. Some of you say, I'm not able to write books, but I always say everybody's able to write books. Um, I give a workshop to, uh, on Wednesday about storytelling, uh, and I'll, I'll help you with story structures. And story structures are great because you can, you can use them for anything, not even for books alone, but also for websites and everything. But writing a book, like 80% is discipline. No, you don't have to be a greatest writer to write a book, but there's one thing that is necessary, because if you're an artist and you want to get your book out, mainly to have some more you know, promotion, a promotional item, it has to have your vision of art in it. And here comes back the values, because your vision on art usually is related to your personal values. And here comes the emotion with it as well. And the great thing is, is that in, if you... If you think of your values each time that you communicate to the outside world, whether it is through your art or whether it is in a book sharing your art vision, people will feel that. Even if you don't call it explicit, explicit they will feel your values because they recognize them in it. And I promise you, in each story, there are hidden values. People recognize those values. They, it's just when you're at a party and you're talking to someone, you're uh, subconsciously you're trying to find out if they f think that the things that you feel are important, that they feel are important as well. And if that's the case, you have a bond. And the same goes with you and your audience, your target audience. Um, you need to have the same values. And the great thing as well is that if you're aligned, if your work and every form of communication is aligned with your values, it doesn't matter if people don't like it. Because you're authentic, you feel good about it, you're in your comfort zone, and it doesn't matter if people don't like it, because you like it and you know why you like it. So um, you can't please the whole world, and you shouldn't. So this is a little exercise that you can do in duos. Like, I, I love to share like brainstorm sessions with more people because with more people you can think of new things. And the thinking exercise is, can you think of other services or products that you can sell other than you are selling now or maybe you aren't selling at all? And just help each other thinking of products that you can sell or new services you can sell because that helps earning money. And you're all very quiet, but now you can talk. So let's take three to four minutes, see how we go. Find a partner and engage. Okay, so 
We are rounding things up. You can dis continue this discussion later. <laughs> by show of hands, by show of hands, who is thinking about it now? Well, that's great. Because I gave you like four minutes, and that's a very limited amount of time, but it will help you later on to think more and more about it. So let's continue. Because if the world doesn't know who you are and where to find you, it's kind of hard to sell any of your work or to present the world your art. We all know that. So you should start sharing your stories online in whatever form you do it. So the first question, who do you sell for whom? What do you sell for whom, sorry? In my case, it's trainings, it's workshops, it's coaching sessions, it's writing material. And the whom, for me, I have broadened up a bit. Because when I started first giving workshops, it was for people who wanted to write books. And although it's on a wish list, a bucket list for most people, they were not finding me enough to get a living out of it. So I need to broaden that horizon and knock on doors of companies and help them with stories as well. So I needed to do that. So, but it had to be clear. It has to be clear. So one of the stories you sell online is actually what you are doing and for whom you are doing and the whom has to do with um, what can people find with you? How, how do you inspire them? Why should they care for your art? And what is your vision on your work or art? Because if you share that vision, again, the values is underneath that, they will understand it better and they'll be more interested. Also, what you can share online is what goes on behind the scene, you know, behind every piece of work, behind every piece of art, um, there's a process behind it. It doesn't just happen overnight. So share that, share that online. And I know some of you are already doing that. Uh, and I'm going to tell something about that later on as well, because you need to do it more often. Um, what other artists or entrepreneurs inspire you and why? You know, this is the part that is also important, because you can be each other's ambassadors. Because I don't really believe in competition. Everybody is unique. And we all inspire each other. So if you become each other's ambassador online by saying what you like in the other and why, they can do the same for you. And you can form alliances online. Um, I have rent a working space uh, where a lot of other female entrepreneurs are at. It's called hashtag work mode. And what they do is they form alliances on Instagram. So that looks like um, I have 10 people, and the deal is that I will always respond on your posts and vice versa. So they respond on each other's posts, and because it's a group of 10 people, uh, more quickly your stories will be shown online first on Instagram, because Instagram has this algorithm, and it chooses based on how often you post things online that are liked by people and are commented on. So that's a really smart way of doing that. So get your stories out there, because you need to be found. As simple as that. And then, you know, I began this title with the cliffhanger, start being present. Being present nowadays is, is easier than ever. We have so many tools available. We have YouTube, we have Pinterest, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, uh, we have LinkedIn. And to get an idea about how many people are on there worldwide, on Facebook alone you have 2,000 million, so that's two billion, 2,000 million people worldwide on Facebook. You have 1,000 million people worldwide on Instagram, and Instagram is like one of the fast-growing media. LinkedIn, you have 500 million people worldwide, and it's actually a well-known medium in Holland as well. And then you have Twitter, which is about 
340 million, uh, yeah, worldwide. These, I just named four, but of course there are many more, but these four all have uh, um, age group of 20 to 39. So if your target audience is between 20 and 39, and I think most are, then these are the media that uh, are very important to you as well, to make yourself known, to get your stories on. I see someone take a picture, so I'm just gonna wait until that picture is taken. <laughs> Right, so I'm just going to give a few examples of people who do it. And the reason I chose her, because she's on Instagram and she only has 1,187 followers. It doesn't have to be that you have 10,000 followers to be successful. No. What she does is she has an art advisory firm. So again, thinking out of the box, what can I do for companies? She has an art advisory firm and she advises company on buying art. What should we buy for this office space? What we should buy for the reception? But she also does that, interestingly enough, for a young, prof young group of people. People who are in their 20s are uh, her customer and they would like to have art advice for their homes. So they're buying a new home or they, and she gives their art advice. And what she also does, which is very smart, is that she uh, presents art on her Instagram account and then she has a deal with the artist that if someone buys her art via her account, she gets a commission. So for her it's an extra way of, of earning money, but it's a win-win because for the artist it's an extra way to sell products. So this is a nice uh, example that you don't have to have like huge amount of followers and still you can get some success. Here we have Anka Block. She's only 25 years old. Uh, her company is called Kunstblok, and I met her uh, at the Dag van de ZZP'er, which is in Holland the biggest event for independent professionals and entrepreneurs. And she um, she won the Freelancer of the Year award. And she's only 25 years old. This is her Facebook account. She has 817 people following her. And she posts a lot of stories behind the scenes, like, oh, I'm going to be at VT Wonen and Design Burst for the first time. I always wanted that. Uh, she posts drawings. She, may, she, she makes charcoal drawings. That's what she does. And she based, she, she based them on a picture. So it could be a picture that a client comes with, uh, or it could be a picture that she takes herself. It's very easy and, you know, for her as well, it's not about how artistic am I? No, I love doing this. And she's not only doing this for people in private homes, but she's also doing it for companies. So she posts online, uh, great, I have an assignment for a big company. They want to have 53 portraits and I'm going to make them. They want to have 53 portraits of employees. That company could have also said, yeah, we're just going to hire a photographer, but they wanted something different. And that's what I want you to think about, because how great would it be if business life would blend into the artist's life? We all love art. They could use some art as well. It would be great, and I think it's possible. For me, LinkedIn at this point is one of the most interesting uh, mediums for me. Um, because for giving uh, trainings in, in storytelling and, and speech coach sessions, LinkedIn is actually the way for me because uh, my target audience right now, the biggest target audience are the managers of, of, uh, of companies and are uh, people who are in politics and everything. So for me, this is more interesting. And what I see is that I get assignments through personal messages on LinkedIn. They will just say, oh, I'm looking for a speaker. Uh, can you come? It's in that and that date. I'm also, um, you know, people can book me at the Speakers Academy, but I prefer they, they approach me um, just directly. So, and they can do that via LinkedIn, and they do. So it pays off. And what I do on LinkedIn is I post a lot of blogs about my passion, about storytelling, about tips that you can learn from if you want to get stories out. And people like to read that. And the funny thing is that people love pictures. For some reason, they love pictures. So if you do write a blog or if you do share a, vis a, a vision you have, post a picture with it. You know, people will see it more often. And I only have uh, 1,400 people um, that are linked with me on LinkedIn. So again, it doesn't take uh, 10,000 people. No. And the great thing about LinkedIn is, of course, if you post something, also people outside your network will see it. 
I post um, a photo of me speaking with the dog from the ZZP'er. It got 10,000 views. I never had 10,000 views. And I didn't even say anything with it. I just said, oh, it was great. That was it. 10,000 views. So think about what pictures you can post online. And then remember that people love people. They love people on pictures. So uh, make sure. I know a lot of people are, yeah, I don't want to be my picture. I don't want it online. And I'm not photogenetic or whatever. Just forget that. People love people on pictures. So it really pays off. And then the last part I want you to think about today is how to seek alliances. Um, I just said I would love businesses to blend in with art. Think out of the box here as well, because if you're working at a consultant agency, for instance, life is its not boring, okay? I'm not saying it's boring, but it's pretty conservative. So if you have a team day or if you have a team session, they are actually looking for something else, something that is totally different from what they are used to. So, you know, bring a workshop, um, a singing workshop or an art workshop or whatever it is. Think about creating a workshop, especially for this group. And it could be a team building session. I mean, art combines people. We've heard that today as well. So it could be uh, from a perspective of a team building session. Uh, I have a friend who does cooking workshops for team building sessions. Well, if you can do cooking workshops, why not drawing workshops or, I don't know, drum workshops? I don't know. But you can think about those things. And I would love that because I know that there are a lot of companies who love that as well. So take some time now, a few minutes, and you can do it for yourself or in duos, where can you find um, places where you can put your new products or services, where you can offer that? And it could be places that you would never think of because it's outside your comfort zone. But the great thing is, what I discovered is we're all human beings. It doesn't matter how high you are in the, in, in the, in the organization, they're all human beings, just like you and me. And um, they find it very refreshing to have something that is not wearing a suit. That's my perspective anyway. So just think, let's take a few minutes. Think about companies where you could, where you could sell your art or in a workshop form or a team building session. Just think about it. Just make a list of three. And it could also be schools. It could be hospitals. You know, basically every organization needs art. That's my perspective anyway. So it could be anything. You can do it by yourself or you can think about it in duos. So this is also something that you can continue to think about. I'm going... The reason why we do this short exercise is, is I want to massage your brain. <laughs> if I could just do a monologue, it would just fly away very easily. But because you take this time to think about it, it's massaging your brain. That's why I'm doing it. Um, one thing I want to, forgot to tell you about uh, the online story sharing. Make sure that you do it often enough. Because if you only post like once every two weeks, it takes a very long time to build up a relationship with your target audience. Um, remember, especially when you're on Twitter or on Instagram, um, it just goes on and on with the information. But it's important if you are using yourself to promote yourself online, it's important you do it frequently. So ideally, you would take like 30 minutes each day to continue doing that. Not only posting, but it's very important to respond to other people as well. So one thing is posting, the other thing is responding to other people. It's very important to build up a relationship with your target audience. Now, sometimes I get questions, yeah, but what if people get tired of it? get tired of me, you know? What if I post too much? I see something now, yeah, what if? Yeah, well, they will just ignore you. <laughs> no, the thing is, um, especially when you're on Instagram, there's so much information. You're like a raindrop in a tropical rainforest. You're like a raindrop in a storm. So they won't notice you if you only post on Instagram once every twi tw uh, two weeks. They won't notice it. So it's a crucial. It's crucial to post frequently. I mean, if you find 30 minutes a day is a lot, which I do, 
then try at least do it three times a week. And I promise you, uh, it takes time to build a relationship. So it could take a year. I'm doing it for five years already, and now people are spontaneously finding me, but it's only because I do it regularly. And I'm doing it on different social media as well. So uh, if someone saw me on Facebook, there's a good chance that they saw me on LinkedIn as well. Or, uh, well, I don't use Twitter a lot anymore, but I have a lot of followers on Twitter. Sometimes I tweet as well. So you have to make choices which media you're going to use, you have to make sure that you post frequently and you have to make sure that you respond to other people as well. Then you're being really social on social media and then you build up a relationship. And people will think of you more uh, when they think they need someone in your area. Okay? Let's do a quiz. I'm getting very personal now, but you do it for yourself. Let's do a quiz. Just think yes or no. First question, do you earn enough money to save about 500 to 1,000 euros a month? You don't have to tell me, just for yourself. Do you have at least two days a week uh, where you can do other things than work? Yes or no? Do you have any insurances that cover when you are, for some reason, not able to work or a time or cover occurring claims while carrying out your profession? Do you have any insurances to cover that? Four, do you work goal-driven and weekly, monthly, yearly, re yearly reflect on what did and didn't work? I do that daily, by the way. Because uh, the thing is, when you reflect on what works and what doesn't work, uh, not only do you learn from it, but you learn a lot also from what worked. You can repeat what worked, so you have more success. Simple as that. Do you take earning money with your art into consideration when you produce work? This one is a special one. Because... Um, I think most artists will be like, yeah, just like me, of course, in the beginning. Yeah, I just love what I do and that's what I want to do. I'm not saying that it should be about the money. No. I'm saying that if you want to continue to do what you love, you have to think about earning money with it. Because otherwise you're obliged to do other things and your energy gets wasted on those other things rather than your art. So you have to take it into consideration. So... Um, <coughs> By show of hands, who of you know that no to at least three of those? Yeah, I think that's like most people. I'm not saying it's a bad thing either. But the thing is that if you do have answered no to all of those questions or most of those questions, you are probably missing out twice or three times the amount of money that you could earn with your art. That's all why I'm doing this thinking exercise. So you're missing out on that. And yeah, I thought it was a very funny picture, this. In 2013, I had this crisis because um, I was not earning enough money anymore um, to pay everything that I wanted to pay. So I had to change things and that's why I came up with new products, that's why I broaden my horizon, think of new alliances, uh, think of other uh, yeah, target audiences that I could use and serve. What happens is that um, I don't have worries anymore about money. And that's nice because now I don't write, I don't have to write for a living anymore, I can write whatever I want to write for myself. So. I have the insurances that cover whenever something happens. Um, so I don't have to worry about that as well. And that is something that you all, you all deserve. I mean, I have saw some great uh, performances yesterday and, and probably will see them tonight as well. And I want all of you to be able to continue doing that. So you deserve that. And of course, it starts with thinking as an entrepreneur as well as being an artist. So that's what this session is about. I like to keep things very simple. So. Um, I, I really enjoyed uh, last month's presentation with all the examples. It really inspired me. I'm not that kind of person. I like to keep it very simple um, because I just want all of you to, you know, to do well. And it starts with simple things. So thank you for your attention. And I wish you all the luck with your art and your entrepreneurship. And maybe I'll see you again. <laughs> Questions, Asia. <laughs> <laughs>
You're right. Okay. Hi, um, I had a question about uh, finding new ways to sell your product or yes. creating new products. Is it not like if you think of too many things, then you're constantly too busy with the whole selling thing? That's why I said choose three things to start with. And it's also about experimenting, because s when you're thinking about the box, something works and something doesn't work. So it's also experimenting. So you have to really test things online. And in that, it helps to have an audience online. So that's why you need to start sharing stories, because um, when you come up with something new, like a workshop, you can test it online if there are people responding on it. How long would you wait? Sorry? <laughs> How long would you test the thing for? Um, well, if I create a workshop, I'm just going to make sure that people are attending it. It doesn't matter how I get it there. I just <laughs> so it, it, it it's it's just because I put all that effort in it. So you have to be sure that you're behind that product. At least you can make make it. Uh, you can test it. Maybe do the first one for free, and see how it goes. Because you learn from that as well. If it's really completely new, but usually when I think of new workshops now, it's not usually completely new for me. So I don't have to test it anymore. It's just a different angle that I choose. And the angle you choose should be about uh, the problems or the challenges that your target audience faces. For instance, with the consultancy, how can we have a team building in a different way, in a different method than we used to? So sh you should think about that, and you should communicate that in your stories. So no, no 20 products. So <laughs> just choose a few. Yeah. I'm not quite sure you're the right person to ask, but um, you said it's important to have an internet presence and to um, post as often as possible and to write and everything, and I understand that. But have you got any advice for people who do not find writing easy? Like you say you've written yes. all your life and you've always done it, but mm -hmm. for some people it's really hard to put words to paper yeah. or screen. I have two uh, answers to that. <laughs> uh, the first answer is um, if you're not good in writing or you feel uncomfortable in writing, you can post pictures and everybody can formulate at least one sentence with that picture. So, um, the, so that's one answer. Just, or you can use vlogs. You know, you can post vlog, a vlog, uh, a video with your smartphone and, you know, and if that doesn't help, um, you can follow, that's the second answer, you can follow a workshop which um, enables you to be more conf confident by using a story structure. Um, there are story structures for blogs, there are story structures for advertising, there's you know, so many story structures out there. And it's all about learning it. But of course, if you're really uncomfortable with it, you have to hire a person who does it for you. There are a lot of VAs out there. It's like a new study, vir virtual assistants. You don't have to do it yourself. So, uh, and of course, I'm not saying that you have to use social media. I'm not saying that at all. I'm only saying that it's a lot of opportunities out there. You can get a, a Latvian robot. Yeah, you can also do that. <laughs> get a robot do it for you. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, sorry, this is a very easy one. Can you please put up that screen again with the five points for our quiz? There you go. <laughs> I don't have a question, but um, just as encouragement, I started um, um, through um, the idea from Gerdien, this daily challenge, and um, just posting um, one thing, one, one, one subject, and it really gets noticed. And this is really a rather easy thing for artists to create something. Yes. I'm very glad that you say that, by the way, because um, when you first start out doing things on new media, like Instagram or something, it kind of feels that you're lonely because you don't have a lot of followers yet, you don't get a lot of response yet, and you'll be like a few weeks, you'll be like, oh, why am I doing this? But you have to continue doing it because it takes time. And trust me, people will notice you once you do it on a daily basis or maybe two, three times a week. But it takes time, so you have to be patient. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, 
Um, I am starting out as a video maker. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and, um, uh, um, well, I have 20 years of experience, but, you know, I'm starting for myself now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can do so many things and for so many audiences. So uh, how, how do I choose or, you know, what to put out there on social media? Yes. Well, you begin by... Um <laughs> I was going to say something really funny, but I'm not going to say it. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, you can begin by buying my book. But <laughs> no, the thing, the th no, because, okay, I'll, I'll try to keep this as short as possible. Um, you have to narrow it down to three things to begin with and uh, really work that out in a proper manner. Thinking, is it realistic? Because do I have the time for it? Do I have the means for it? Especially when you're in a video business. It takes a lot of time editing films and everything. I mean, I don't have to tell you that. So uh, come up with things that are easy for you to produce as well. Not only like big projects, but also small ones that are easy to produce for you. Um, and there you have to think out of the box again as well. So you have to come up with something. I mean, look at all the independent professionals. Most of them need videos for their websites. But then I would think of a, a format, like a small format that you can um, present to them. Like um, it could be on your homepage. Think of a homepage format with a story structure that is uh, easy, applicable for a lot of independent professionals to, you know, to introduce themselves and what they do. Something like that, but it should be easy. So you always have to find the balance, whatever you do as an entrepreneur, always find the balance. How much time do I have? Do I have the means? And how much uh, money do I earn with it? Oh, at the very back, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to know because of, for for Facebook pages, yeah, um, uh, they they told me or I, I heard that uh, it's um, because of the data security, mm -hmm. uh, you shall close them. What do you think about this? Oh uh, well, that's a whole different um, question. Um, I think that is something that everyone needs to decide for themselves, because I need that business-wise, so I won't close it. Uh, and I, I accepted the fact that um, that it's not safe for me online. Because uh, if, I, if I would, you know, think of all of that, it, it, it's done already with me. I'm on so many platforms. I have like a million passwords and I'm not going to stress about that. I just chose not to stress about it. I'm not sure if that's what you're meaning. I mean, of course, I have an opinion on, on, uh, on data security. I think it's terrible that things are leaking and that um, you know, our, our, our personal information gets out there. I think that's terrible. So I'm with you on that, but um, you know, uh, I cannot focus on everything in life. So that's for, for other people. Uh, uh, the question is, um, if you are responsible for the data ah, which are uh, yeah. on your page. I mean... Uh, yeah, but, uh, but you are, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. but you cannot. Or well, can, you, uh, uh, well, you should not... I mean, I'm not sure if I'm getting it right, but you should not, for instance, uh, post anything that's uh, illegal or copyright uh, uh, sensitive. Um, I, the, all the pictures you saw are free of copyrights, so I don't use pictures that are not free for copyrights. So I'm very attentive in that sense. Is that what you mean? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, uh, when you have a, a web page, uh, you need to uh, inform everyone that it's yes. Google Analytics and, and cookies and everything. Ah, these you mean yeah? like the, uh, the, the new law yes, that was new, introduced new in each country? And, and okay. they told me, uh, yeah. in former times, it, uh, Facebook was responsible for that, what, what is on your web page. And now they're not anymore. And, right. That's and, and, true. Uh, yeah. Then they said, yes. if you are on the secure side, yeah. you need to close the Yeah, page. well, you, you asked my opinion, but it's not a matter of opinion. You should just, you are, it's by law you are responsible responsible for the data so you should be uh, sen you should be taking care of that like all of us so it's not a matter of opinion then right we should all take care of the data 
and, and you, yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm not. I mean, you don't have to close your Facebook page because of that. You can just make adjust adjustments, or um, you know, I'm not an AVG expert on this, but you know, other people are. Look into it. Dive into it. You don't want any claims. You just want to worry about your art, right? <laughs> Okay. Alexandra, thank you. Thank you get you. as well a nice present <laughs> to thank remember you. us. Thank you. Well done. Thinking out of the box. <laughs> yeah. Jill, the last part today. We have a moment to stretch, stand up, turn around, get some blood going. This is because I can't sit for hours. So <laughs> I think it's good to move, isn't it? Okay, have a sit down. So we're going to welcome to the stage our final guest, which is uh, Talita Navine. So Talita, if you can come forward, let's give her a hand for encouragement. Um, yeah, it's okay. Have a sit down. So, our final artist for today, who uh, we're going to interview. So, Talita, you've been at CA on and off for a, a number of years. So, that's right. Yeah. So, you're quite familiar with. Uh, let's come a bit closer. <laughs> everything that goes on here, and probably seen lots of changes at CA over the years as well. I do recall my first visit at CA. I was working in the artist cafe, oh. cafe baking the French fries for oh the wow. artists. Oh, okay. <laughs> really nice. So, yeah, fantastic. You've I seen it all. I think that was more than half of my life ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. And now, you're now known as a primarily a jazz singer and performer, but also um, a, a, vocal a vocal teacher, choir director, and songwriter. So... Can you just tell us something about how your journey began into all of this? Mm, actually, my journey began, um, I wanted to become a drama teacher, oh. but my audition was a drama, mm -hmm. so that was <laughs> out of my book. <laughs> and um, then I, I didn't know what, to, what I wanted to become, so I... My mother took me to this woman who did a test for that, who took me a test. Okay. And she said, you would be a nice teacher for school. So I started to become a teacher for preschool. Okay. And then when I was studying that, I thought, no, there's too much artistic blood in my veins. Mm -hmm. And now it comes. Then um, one of the, my classmates mm. invited me to do audition for Adrian Snell's um, Alpha and Omega, which was... Oh. Also, the choir was led by Continental Sounds. Ah, so that's okay. how I got to know Christian music. Ah, and okay. while touring the bus from place to place, yeah. um, somebody said to me, you're a great jazz singer. You should study jazz singing. And I thought, that's it. Okay. <laughs> that's how it went. Mm, fantastic. And so you went and had some training um, at one of the conservatoires. Is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. I was in a jazz band from, okay. from the age of 17. Okay. Till about 19, mm -hmm. and um, when I got to know Christ, uh, the, something else started to yeah. emerge in me—a longing to sing the gospel. Okay. So Adrian Snell was a great yeah. thing. Okay. And uh, I started to do the uh, conservatory when I was beginning 20s. Okay. Yeah. That's great. And then from then on, you continue to develop as a, per a performer, but you've obviously branched out as well into these other areas. How did that? How did that happen, that part of the journey? Yeah, um, so when you, when you study, you probably know when you study uh, uh, jazz singing, you do as well the, the singing yourself, but also mm -hmm. the teaching. So you have these two tracks. Mm -hmm. And I liked both. I, mm -hmm. I love to sing, but I also love to teach. So mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. always kept on doing both tracks. Okay. 
Yeah, okay, yeah. that's that's really good because quite a lot of people who are sat in the seat are, are saying they love their art, but they there's something else that they do to make sure that their art can happen. Yeah. So you're in quite an unusual position in that you love both performing yeah. and you love teaching. And, and you've also been doing some other things as well, uh, not just teaching vocal coaching and choirs, but you've also moved into working with children with disabilities. Yes, I did it. Uh, I also find psychology really interesting. So mm. I, I did a course on Feuerstein. I don't know, does anybody know Reuven Feuerstein? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Reuven ah, Feuerstein. I did a couple of courses and worked with uh, okay. children with uh, learning disabilities. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. So that teaching that you did a long, long time ago has kind of come back around. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it goes yeah. through my life. Yeah, it's that's part of it. That's fantastic. Yeah. And um, so coming a, a bit into the present, what have you found yourself doing recently in terms of projects that might be of interest to people? Mm. Well, actually, last year for me was a, a year of uh, getting replenished again. Mm -hmm. Uh, water onto the artistic soul, I would say, because okay. I, I worked a lot and mm -hmm. I found myself a bit dried out. And what do you do when you're dried out? You have to water your soul, you have to water your heart. And mm -hmm. I thought, what does it mean? For me, it was mm -hmm. sitting down and writing down what I like, what makes me happy. Okay. And a one for one, I just did these things that I wrote down. Okay. So that was my last year. And one of the things included a, a storytelling course, because I've always loved stories. Mm -hmm. Is Alexandra still here? No, she's out of thing. I love what she's doing. Yeah. And um, uh, so I did two courses on storytelling. Okay. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to combine my singing with the storytelling? So that will be my new project. Okay, so a dream for the future, perhaps? That's a dream. Yeah, okay, so waiting to be birthed and to happen. Exactly. Oh, that's wonderful. So um, with all the experience that you have, um, are there any sort of things that you think you could give us as takeaways, pieces of advice that would be really helpful, particularly for others who might be in a similar situation to you, performer and teacher? Um, things that you've perhaps learnt along the way that would be helpful for people. Mm. Don't work seven days a week. <laughs> <laughs> when when uh, Alexander showed that thing, uh, have you got two days a week where you do, where you don't do work? I thought yes, that's so important that you do other things because you're not only a human doing. Mm. So mm. for me, that was very important. Mm. Um, but also collaborating with others, because uh, I'm a um, self-standige, zonder mm -hmm. personeel. Mm. Um, Self-employed. Self okay. Which yeah. sometimes means that I'm behind my desk on my own. Um, and that's not always the easiest place mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. So I've learned I need to work together with others to mm -hmm. get, get creative juices flowing. Mm -hmm. that's so. Great. So collaboration has collaboration been important. Is very Relationship important. has been important. Exactly. Mm. And what could you just say? Perhaps some of the. I mean, that's a, that's a bit of a challenge in itself, making sure that you don't work alone. But have there been any other challenges that you've thought, oh, you know, th those have been my hard points that I've had to overcome? Mm, good question. Um. Yeah. Uh, what really uh, touched me was, uh, I forgot, what was your name again? Etienne. Etienne. You said every Monday morning I block time mm. to be with God. Mm. And um, that is so, so, so important. Because when you talk about life, you need to be mm. connected to the vine mm -hmm. in order to produce. Mm. So connect to the vine. And for me, um, mm -hmm. vine, uh, wine, mm -hmm. joy. Mm -hmm. So it brings back life and joy. And that's what I need. But that's what people need also through me. And we need that through each other. Mm. Okay, that's really, really helpful. So um, just wondering if at this point, because I know you have lots of experience, but if there's any questions that any of you guys would like to ask Talita, um, bearing in mind this teaching, performing kind of dual role that she has, maybe some things that are coming up for some of you who are in a similar position 
you might like to ask her. Any, any thoughts? Or if there's anything else you felt you would like to share while they're thinking, just about the experience that you've had today or anything about your journey that you think that has been a highlight for me. Uh, yeah, what I was also thinking, because mm. I love jazz, mm. but not everybody loves jazz. Mm. So I, um, the one, uh, my, my platenbaas, my um, producer, mm. he said, well, your, your music is for a small segment okay. of people. And that, you know, that really was like an arrow into my heart, like, ah, that hurts. Yeah. yeah. But then I thought, but this is my language. Mm -hmm. And um, and that helped me to become even more proud of it and be mm -hmm. true to mm -hmm. what I like and okay. love. Okay. And maybe mix it with, with things so that that I you know, I that I create connection with people yes. because yeah. when you some sorts of jazz create distance. Okay, yeah. But you have to include, but that's what yeah. I always do. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Any question? Oh, we do have a question. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, I would like to know, as you said, you don't like sitting behind your desk and work for your own, um, and you rather search for collaborations. Um, what kind of experiences do you have with collaborations and... Um, how do you connect with people? Uh, I have to... That reminds me of... Um, when I've made three CDs, and you can't make a CD on your own. So then you start asking musicians, asking a producer, asking a studio technicians, and those forms of collaboration are great. So... Uh, uh, I can think of the songs, I can make the heart of the structure and ha have other musicians then bring their creativity into it. So that's how I've done it till now. Hello, I've just some informative uh, question. Do you still work with uh, disabled children or people? No, not uh, um, not underneath the Feuerstein flag, so to speak. But I, d I use the principles all the time in whatever teaching I, I do. Talita, thank you ever so much. And we look forward to hearing you perform. Are you performing tonight? Tomorrow night. Okay, fantastic. Well... Talita Navine, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Time off and uh, have a nice dinner and see you here at a quarter to eight, please. Thank you. <laughs>